Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being with us here today on this special Mother's Day and a happy Mother's Day to all of you out there. We love you. We honor you. And uh, I just want to start by talking about you, our AC moms, and giving you the why behind our AC moms. We're actually in a series that looks at the why, and I thought, man, you've been seeing videos, hopefully, all week about how awesome our AC moms are, and I wanted to be the one to tell you the why behind it. And I think it's kind of one sweeping reason. Here it is. Are you ready? Why our AC moms are so awesome is because they believe Jesus is enough. That's what drives them to be worshipers. Our AC moms, they really do believe that they don't have to be enough. And that doesn't, that doesn't drive despair. It drives worship of Jesus. It also drives a warrior-like status with them. They're tender warriors, but they go to battle. They know how to grieve. They know how to win those unseen battles day in and day out. Why? Not because they think they're enough, but because they believe that Jesus is enough. And finally, our AC moms. What's kind of like unique and special about them is they know how to wait on the Lord. Why? Because they believe that Jesus is enough. So AC moms, thank you for being just fantastic worshipers. Women who know how to be tender warriors. And, uh, and our moms who are committed to prayer because you believe Jesus is enough. You know how to wait on the Lord. God is using you to shape us and transform us and bring Jesus to the world right here through the AC. Thank you, and we love you. Father, we just want to ask a special blessing over our AC moms today that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would um, bless them, encourage them, allow them to experience you as their great comfort and their great conqueror. God, and would you multiply the gospel both to them and through them. Father, we thank you for the good, good gifts that they are to us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, we are glad that you are with us today. And uh, as we think about um, our moms being worshipers and warriors and, and people who know how to wait on the Lord, uh, we also know that um, those things also include suffering. Um, the, the, the two actually go together, not just for our AC moms, but for all of us who fit that category of, of, of people who uh, make much of Jesus. Suffering is a very normal part of all of our um, existences. And, and we are in a series right now that looks at the why of suffering. And um, we, we, we're, we're believing that um, in the exploration of the why, th th there's going to be um, great encouragement found. The person, the promises of God, the power of God can be found as we explore the why of our current suffering and, and even of suffering um, that we're going to look at historically here. And, uh, and that's the series that we're in. And we've just been um, contemplating this, this question. I mean, and I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but my, my question to you is, do you ever ask yourself why uh, as it pertains to your suffering or the suffering of our world? Like, like what's behind that? Or, or how can a good God allow fill in the blank? Um, if that's you, uh, this is a series uh, for you, and we want to uh, welcome you in. And uh, if you're a guest to the AC, uh, it's so good to have you. Please feel free uh, to explore Jesus and the things of faith with us. Uh, we count you an honored guest. And if you're part of the family of the AC, it's so good uh, to be with you guys again um, and as, we, as we look into God's word together. And so this is week three of our series called Why Experiencing God in the Dark. And uh, we're looking at five historical cases that are in the Bible um, that include suffering. And we're, we're trying to explore the why of those cases, believing that as we remain biblically anchored, God will bring um, encouragement and in, in even potential um, revelation to our current suffering. So what we're not saying is that we, we know the why 
to every difficult moment. What we are saying is there are some biblical cases that can be looked at and examined. And, and we can get to uh, some pretty conclusive um, reason for the why. And we're believing in that journey. Um, God's going to meet us and, uh, and give us more of himself. And so we, we'd love to invite you along. We have some invitations uh, that we want to make uh, that, that we've been talking about every week. Um, and th- these are just, hey, briefly, kind of set your mind on these things. And, th- and they're like this. Start where you are. So if you are a person that is, um, man, it's, just, it's a hard week for you and you're really struggling or it's a hard season, uh, start there. If asking the question why is not something that you normally do or you don't even know if you have permission to do, then, then start there. We, wanna, we want you to be able to start where you are but invite you into this journey uh, with us. Number two is come with us. Just, just come with us and commit to um, exploring this with us here um, as, as a church, right where you are. Allow for discovery is invitation number three. Like, allow for yourself to potentially learn something and be open uh, to being a lifelong learner, especially uh, with the things of God. And uh, number four is embrace the tension. That's something that we're really going to be leaning into uh, this morning uh, in, our, in our study. And, and, and so, man, just embrace the tension of, at times, two different truths that live together, but it's sometimes hard to make them match up fully. And finally, readjust, readjust your expectations. This is not a top-down authoritative, like, we know why. This is, man, as we explore this together, we're, we're co-discoverers of who God is in the midst of our suffering. And so the question that we're looking at today is, why did Joseph suffer such personal injustice? Uh, just a little bit about Joseph to set the context um, for you as to, so you have an idea of who he is and kind of what was going on in his uh, current situation or in, in his historic situation. Um, three things to know about Joseph, and, and uh, this is kind of how we'll look at the story as well. Is Joseph was part of the family of promise. He was also part of the family of pain. And finally, he was part of the family of provision. Um, things you may or may not know about Joseph. This is Joseph of the Old Testament, and he was part of this um, family of promise, and, and he was in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then comes Joseph. Um, he would be the one known as uh, having the coat of many colors. Uh, he had, you know, some, some pretty serious family issues, especially with his brothers, which led us to uh, explore the family of pain. And uh, this is a person who walks through grave injustice um, that he suffers through uh, due to his family and, and even another uh, family that he enters into. And uh, it's a Joseph that uh, take, the story takes place, of a, a lot of it, in Egypt um, in, in, under uh, Pharaoh's reign. Uh, and then this is a, a story of Joseph uh, uh, or the Joseph that ends up providing uh, for the needs, really, of the world uh, through uh, much of his suffering. And so um, you, before we kind of hop in here, we're going to be in, at the end of Genesis. Um, uh, just to give you uh, a little bit of a framework uh, or, or a theology of suffering, uh, that, that's been a place where we've um, just, we've we at least touched on it every week. And I think it's important for us to touch on it this week. Uh, theology of suffering, what that means is this is like God's perspective of suffering. This is what suffering look like, looks like according uh, to the Bible. And it's got a couple of, uh, of kind of like components to it. If we can go to that next slide on, on theology of suffering. Yeah, so, so um, suffering doesn't start with God, but, but the, the framework starts with God. And God created things and uh, everything was good. Uh, there was no sin in the world and, and there was perfect harmony that every creat- uh, creature was experiencing. And then sin entered the world and broke that. Um, sin is rebellion against God. It's um, finding our life in joy and meaning outside of God. And uh, it's really crimes against a holy and just God. And where uh, sin enters, so too is shalom broken. Shalom is a Hebrew word which means peace or harmony. Uh, And so when Adam and Eve sinned, our original parents, it it was like passed down to all of us. But when that original sin came in, um, so too was the original design broken. And the shalom, the peace that, that was um, being experienced between God and people, and the peace that was being experienced am- amongst uh, 
Adam and Eve, and, and even within themselves, that was broken. Um, it's one of the consequences of, of sin, and uh, sin breaks and ruins uh, things. And so uh, that's the world that we now live in, and that's where suffering comes from. We live in a world that has been broken by sin, and now as we walk through that world, we are affected by the brokenness, and thus suffering is part of our normal reality. And so suffering is directly linked uh, to sin and, and the brokenness of the world that we find ourselves in. Uh, but God is not apathetic. God is on a mission and passionately loving his creation, and he promises to renew shalom. And that's exactly uh, what he uh, has done through Jesus Christ and uh, in Christ coming to earth, being fully man and fully God. He had no sin of his own, and he was an acceptable substitute. And so uh, Jesus goes to a cross, and he, and he takes on the penalty, the fullness that um, our sin would deserve in light of a holy and righteous God. And Jesus is crushed in our place. Uh, his uh, righteousness um, is given to us through faith in his finished work, and our unrighteousness, our sin, is put upon him. He pays the penalty that we should have paid and dies the death that we should have died. And in our place, uh, on the third day, comes back from the dead. And he overcomes our sin. He overcomes our death. He absorbs um, the consequences and the reality of our suffering. And he comes out on the other side victorious and invites us to be forgiven of our sin, to, to um, begin to have our shalom restored, and one day promises to come back in full restoration, making all things new. And that begins for people like you and for people like me who acknowledge themselves to be sinners and in need of a great Savior. Call out upon the name of Jesus, turning from self and sin, resting in his finished work. God immediately brings about a new shalom between us and then one day, we'll come back and remove all suffering, all sin. And it will be in perfect union with him and all creation. That's the framework for suffering that we enter into um, this teaching and all of our teachings with. And so again, we ask the question, uh, why the personal suffering of Joseph? And really, where was God um, in, in the midst of this. And, and so there's a theme that's going to run through Joseph um, that we're going to see here. And um, the scriptures call it uh, in verse 21 of chapter 9, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor. I've just kind of, the, the idea here is, is I, I, I've like maybe renamed it to be a bit more memorable for you. And it's a phrase that I love this phrase. And here's how it goes. Um, Keep going. He's winning. Say that with me. Keep going. He's winning. I don't know if you said it in home or not, but I'm going to give you one more chance. Keep going. He's winning. That was like inscribed on Joseph's heart throughout all of this suffering. Let's look at his story in Genesis um, chapter 37 verses uh, 1 through 3. We get to see that he's part of the family of promise. Um, God promised to make it right. He promised to enter into our suffering, absorb it, and then renew it. And he does that through Jesus, as I just uh, shared. But, but Jesus was going to come through a family. There was a family of promise that God was going to work through. And it was the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see that in verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father sojourning in the land of Canaan. It mentions this family of of promise, that God promised to not leave us in our suffering, that he would rescue us through the person of Jesus Christ who would come through a specific family. Joseph is a part of this family, and his heart knows to keep going despite circumstances because God is winning this would be critically important because not only was he a part of the family of promise, but he was also a part of the family of pain. Promise and pain are sometimes dual 
components. In um, Genesis 37 and 39 and 40 and 41, uh, we see this worked out. If you want to take a, a picture of this screen, these are some of the, the passages that explain um, or describe the family of pain. And um, really, it can, it can be, uh, the catalyst for this can be summed up in verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him, that's Joseph, more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. You might be with us this morning and be a part of a family of pain. This might be very uh, tender and real for you. You might not come from that situation. This might be a bit foreign for you. But for Joseph, his family was not only a great source of promise, but it was a great source of pain. And so his brothers were jealous. They hated him. And uh, as the story unfolds, verses 23 through 24 of chapter 37, um, they strip him of his robe, throw him into a pit, and they sell him to the Ishmaelites who were traveling by. The Ishmaelites take him into Egypt. The story picks up in chapter 39. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, bought him. Uh, after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Okay, so Joseph leaves one um, family of pain, and then he enters into another family, Potiphar's family, high-ranking official whose wife starts to pursue Joseph. But Joseph being a man of integrity, Joseph knowing that he could keep going because God is winning somewhere in his heart, refuses. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He tells her. He also mentions his master being good to him. And this is the way your servant uh, has treated me, she then later tells in, in, a, in a fabricated moment where um, Joseph is in the house and she is in the house and, and she's, um, you know, she wants to, to sleep with him. She wants to be with him and he won't do it. And, and so um, he, he flees, but she grabs a piece of his clothing and then she tells uh, a fabricated story of like, this is how your servant has treated me. She shows his, uh, his, his, the piece of clothing that he had there. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. And um, as I was studying this, uh, one of the things that I came across was this idea that um, if Joseph's, if Potiphar had really believed his wife, he would have killed Joseph. But he knew his wife was lying, so he imprisons Joseph. More personal injustice. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor. Joseph knew, keep going. He's winning. He's winning. Well, the suffering doesn't end there. In, in chapter 40, Joseph does uh, some really cool things in jail, and he starts to interpret dreams, and um, he's, he, he's just given this, this beautiful gift, and uh, he interprets dreams for the cupbearer, and it looks like Joseph's going to get out because the cupbearer is going to like let people know you got to get Joseph out because he can interpret dreams. But it says in verse uh, chapter 40, but the cupbearer forgot him. And after two years, Pharaoh dreamed, and Joseph was summoned. Two more years of waiting and trying to keep going because he's winning. It was as if Joseph was kept by the person and the promises and the power of God no matter what his situation. Well, finally, he's part of the family of provision uh, in this story. In chapter 41, um, it explains some of this. Uh, he, he goes before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh wants him to interpret his dream, and he's like, I can't do it, but God can. And he tells Pharaoh that there's going to be seven years of a ton of food, and there's going to be seven years of famine, and that Pharaoh should, like, store it up, and he should get somebody to store it up. And uh, Pharaoh's like, Joseph, you're my guy. Um, and so uh, uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. Uh, and during the seven plentiful years, Joseph's in charge of storing it up, and he, he rises to great power. Um, and then it says uh, in, in verse, uh, chapter 41, verse 55, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And here's what Pharaoh says, go to Joseph. Whatever he says, 
to you do. So when the famine, verses 56 and 57, had spread over all the land, Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to buy, to Joseph, to buy grain. Because the famine was severe over all the earth. Later in chapter 45, Joseph says, it was to preserve a remnant. Joseph says, I came here, this is when he's talking to his brothers, to preserve life, but it was to preserve a remnant. It was to preserve the family that God was going to work through. And Joseph was like a foreshadowing of Jesus, who's the greater Joseph, who would suffer radical personal injustice in order to preserve life and save many. And so uh, the story of Joseph is very much about the person and the promises and the power of God. And what we want to do is look at the why behind these personal injustices that Joseph suffered. Like, like, what was God doing in the midst of this suffering? And, and why? Why did Joseph suffer like this? This might be a question for you. Certainly, if you are a recipient of personal injustice, this will be an area that is very tender. We want to walk through with sensitivity. And what we're not saying is that we have a conclusive answer to your why. But what we can do is look at the why behind Joseph's personal injustice and see if God can meet us in the midst of our own suffering, whatever it might be. And so the why behind Joseph's suffering. Um, come with me to chapter 45. This is like the, the highlight of the drama. This is, this is the pinnacle of the drama. This is when Joseph gives the great why. Are you ready? And now, he's speaking to his brothers. His brothers had come. They had come for food. They had come for survival. They didn't recognize Joseph. Then Joseph um, shows himself to the brothers. And he says, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He's like, don't, don't be distressed. I'm going to tell you something. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Hold on right there. Joseph is giving them the answer to his why. You sold me here. You did this. Joseph is not ignoring the pain or the heartache of his why. While at the same time, Joseph is acknowledging, for God sent me before you to preserve life. You sold me, God sent me. Two truths that are existing, although one having greater precedence than the other. He goes on in, 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 in verse 6, For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And then he tells them to go and bring his father. Bring the people in to Israel. In chapter 50, verse 20, at the end of Genesis Joseph says this, As for you, you meant evil against me. That's a true, hurtful reality. 
but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Dual realities. Dual realities. Two things existing at the, t- at the same time. What was the why behind Joseph's suffering? Well, we see that it was the evil of others that created an environment that made Joseph a victim. It was the evil of his brothers. It was the evil of Potiphar's wife, even the cupbearer. And so, so Joseph very much was a victim. But we also see that God was allowing this evil to take place because the heart of God was in play here as well. Because God wanted to preserve life. Our God is a savior, even at great cost. God sent me before you to preserve life. And so we see here that Joseph is both a victim and a victor. The question would be, which one wins? Which one dominates? And that may be the question that you're wrestling through right now. Because it's not like one goes away or one completely erases the other or one says you can forget about the other. But the one that you choose to lean into, the one that you choose to live out of, will be the one that has the most dominant force in your life and for the lives around you. Joseph chose to lean into not forgetting, but finding his life in the truth of God, in the victory of what God wanted to do. David Guzik, in his commentary, writes this, It is fair to ask, why was Joseph in Egypt? Was it because of the sin of his brothers or because of the good plan of God? The answer is that both aspects were true. None of it was for a loss. It, check this. If the family did not go into Egypt, they would assimilate among the pagan tribes of Canaan and cease to become a distinctive people. God had to put them in a place where they could grow and yet remain a distinct nation. Charles Spurgeon writes, 1800s, prolific English preacher, how wonderfully those two things meet in practical harmony the free will of man, and the predestination of God. Man acts just as freely and just as guiltily as if there were no predestination, what, whatever. And God ordains, arranges, supervises, and overrules just as accurately as if there were no free will in the universe. You see, Joseph is asked to live in the tension between victim and victor. And he's invited to experience God in that darkness. And so I look at the question of why today? Why your suffering? Why our suffering? Why is there suffering in the world both personal and beyond? And While I don't come down with conclusive situational evidence, what I do believe the Lord would want us to do is to consider Jesus in the midst of our suffering. That we should consider the very person and promises of God in the midst of our today. And what I'm going to do in our in our application here is I'm going to address moms, but this is to everyone. Why today? Consider Jesus. Would you consider that God in this season might be allowing 
this suffering or your suffering in order to bring life where there might be death. Much like Joseph experienced. You see, personal suffering can at times be both protective of others and provisional. This is the gospel way. Death, then life. This is true in your marriage. This is true in your relationships. This is true in your sobriety. This is true with your children. You see, this is also true in the season of COVID-19. Moms, I am sure of it because I live with an amazingly beautiful wife. Moms, I know that you are experiencing daily death in the midst of this season. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom. But I know that you are giving of yourselves in a very unique and demanding way that quite possibly you've never given of yourself before. My wife told me the other night, she said something to this effect. Uh, It was, I don't know what time it was. The kids were in bed-ish. And uh, she looked at me and she said, I'm going upstairs to die. Translation, she was going to bed. And that was just kind of her reality. It was like, man, this day had just taken the best of her. And now there was nothing. But listen, moms, your daily deaths are preserving life. They're preserving life in your family, and they are preserving life outside of your family because you are willing to stand in the gap day after day after day after day, fighting unseen battle after unseen battle after unseen battle. God is winning through you. So keep going. Keep going. This is the first mention in the Bible, this is Guzik as well, of the Holy Spirit coming upon a man, talking about Joseph. It's interesting to note that it was in regard to practical things, because Pharaoh and Joseph have this uh, interaction, and, and Pharaoh says, where else can we find the Spirit of God like it, like it rests on Joseph, or something to that effect. And it was in the midst of practical things. He could see, watch this, he could see it in his character, in his message, in his knowledge, in his wisdom, and in his humility. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit can be seen in very practical ways in our character and in our humility. Moms, listen, if you have a heart that cares that your children come to know Jesus, then it's going to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe there is no other time like the present where they can see through your character and your care in the very practical things the person of the Holy Spirit. Where else can we find the Spirit of God? Like it's upon moms right now who are very practically changing diapers making meals, sacrificing so many things on their behalf, trying to balance schedules which might keep them in the home or or might have them out in the medical field or in a workplace that's still happening right now. Where else can we find the Spirit of God like it's upon you right now as your children and your family watch you navigate and give the best of yourself for others? Keep going. He's winning through you. You see, I love this saying, keep going, he's winning. But what the Lord was impressing on my heart is that he's winning actually through people, and specifically, moms, he's winning through you. He uses people to preserve life. He includes them with great love and compassion in what he's doing. And right now, he is winning through you. My wife, I was talking to my wife before she went upstairs to die. And I said, what, what, Mother's Day sermon, like, what do you think? What do you want? What is it? And she, she said something to me like this. She's like, man, I, I just want to know that these efforts are being valued. That, and I was like, oh, you mean that it, that it matters, that it all matters? She's like, yeah. Listen, I want to tell you something. It all matters. It all matters. 
every detail, every moment. There is so much that is happening, and it all matters. And God is using it all. Would you consider in this season that God might be allowing this particular suffering in order to do good when others meant harm? Almost as if he is sending you ahead so that others can thrive. This is something that author and advocate Christine Kane knows much about. Christine Kane is, is uh, with her husband, founder of A21, which is an establishment that um, is focused on abolishing modern-day uh, human trafficking. And they have rescued thousands of people uh, from human trafficking. But Christine herself comes from a place of being unwanted, experiencing sexual abuse from, I believe it's age 3 to 15, in a background that's very dark, filled with personal injustice. And yet Christine is a worshiper. She is a warrior, and she is a woman who knows how to wait upon the Lord. Referring to herself and how she felt uh, as a shame leper based on what happened to her, she says this, So I grew up feeling a lot of rejection, shame, insecurity, fear, anger. Over the years, I've had to fight to renew my mind to a place where I understand at the core of my being that Jesus is trustworthy. She said that healing it depends on vulnerability and basically allowing access to your wounds. And that God does not waste our hurts. Thousands of people have been pulled from the grips of slavery, human trafficking. Because God has used the suffering and the evil that Christine endured to preserve life, to save many. And you understand this is sensitive and might be very difficult to hear. So I proceed with great gentleness. please consider that although you may be a, a very real victim, and that is real and hurtful and devastating and never should have happened, would you consider that Jesus is redeeming that suffering even now to preserve life through you and through the comfort that you've received as Jesus has rescued you? I'm referring to the thought that uh, you right now very much may be uh, someone who is um, leaning into generational brokenness and, and preventing the evil from continuing. Sam Storm's pastor and author says the sinful behavior of one generation can have lingering and disastrous consequences on subsequent members of that family line. You cannot be held morally accountable before God for the sins of your father or mother, but you can be made involuntarily to suffer from the social, economic, and spiritual consequences of their sin. We see this in addiction. We see this in abuse. We see this in abandonment. And we see that in 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, that Jesus comforts us so that we might be a comfort to others. And so I'm just wondering if, if this is a time where, where God is writing a new story through you and this stops now because of you and what God is doing through you. So may I gently and lovingly, 
encourage you to keep going, moms, however this might apply to you, because he's winning through you. Well, would you also consider that this might be a season where God is allowing your suffering to bring something beautiful later, like it did for Joseph? You see, uh, 20, it, t- it took Joseph 27 years before he was able to say what he said in verses 40, or chapters 45 and, and 50. 27 years started when he was 17. 27 years later, he's able to say, man, God meant it for good. Guzik again says, normally God allows good things to develop slowly. Think about this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he, she are old, they will not depart from it. As you walk and as you lie down, as you walk by the way, share these things uh, with your children. Rejoice in sufferings, because it builds and gives endurance and character and hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Listen, people, these things take time. Training a child walking by the way as you rise and as you, as you sleep. Uh, endurance that eventually leads to hope. These things take time. And as hope is formed in you, mom, then and only then can you give the hope to your children. A hope that does not put us to shame. The hope of Jesus given to your children. It takes time to be formed in you so that you actually have it to give to them. So would you believe with me that Jesus is doing something in you and your family that takes time? And because of that, would you keep going? Because he's winning through you. Now this is where we close, and we close with experience. Because God is not just a God to be considered, he's a God to be experienced. And this is my invitation to you. God kept Joseph in the midst of this narrative. God is keeping you in Christ, but there's a very real sense where Joseph, by the grace of God, kept God. It's like he had these promises somewhere in his heart and on his heart. He was in a foreign land. He didn't have access to the things he might have had access to back with his family. Things were different. This was a way different place where Joseph was suffering when he went into Egypt. And yet he was able to maintain the promises of God. It was like they were engraved or maybe for our context tattooed on his heart. If you've been around the AC for any amount of time, you know that uh, tattoos are kind of like artwork on the wall around here. And so I thought I would close with an image of a tattoo. And what I, what I looked up was like, what's the process of a tattoo? Well, first you pick your design, and then this website tells me that you prepare for pain. That there will be needles that are going just beneath the surface of your skin like a sewing machine to ink you. That it could take hours or it could take days and that touch-up work might be needed. Like, so prepare for pain. Because I believe that God is calling us, and specifically you right now, moms, to tattoo the promises of Jesus on your heart. Pick your design. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to life which promises you need right now and then prepare for pain. Prepare for God through his spirit to ink your heart through the suffering that you are now experiencing with the promise of God so that it is something that is accessible and available to you. And although it may take time, Jesus is enough, and he's worth it every time. 
Father, we ask that you would indeed tattoo our hearts with the promises of Jesus. We need to experience those promises. We need for you to keep us and for you to give us the grace to keep you. And so we ask right now that you would begin, even as I speak, to bring one or two promises to mind for our moms and for everyone here, but specifically for our moms. And then would they prepare themselves for you to write it upon their hearts over and over and over again so that they might access it in the midst of this journey that you have them on today. Father, if there are those among us who don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord right now, they can experience the fullness of forgiveness and hope if they will simply tell you, Father, I realize I'm a sinner and I recognize that you are dearly in love with me, that you sent your son to die for me and that he has overcome my sin and death. I trust him as my Savior, as my Lord, as my great treasure and turn from myself and sin to you. Forgive me and give me this life. I trust you. We trust you, Father, and we love you. Would you bless all of us with your great presence and power and promises today, Father, and especially our moms. In Christ's name.